All right, people, welcome to Unit 8, Topic 8.5. This is decolonization movements of the 20th century. Previously, we looked at the spread of communism, uh, and we looked at how the two superpower, two superpowers of the world at that time, the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, attempted to spread their ideologies and provide economic assistance and, su and support to many third world countries who are attempting or who had already achieved independence through decolonization. So while the drama of the Cold War is unfolding during this time, we have many of these decolonization movements from the 30s all the way up to the late 90s, okay? So let's take a look. All right, so the focus is on government, absolutely, government reactions and government actions. What's the objective? We're going to compare the processes by which various peoples pursued independence. Now, there's two main ways that you need to know. One method was negotiated, nonviolent, diplomatic independence. And the other method was straight up armed struggle, rebellion for independence. Now, our super focus today is women. How did they fit? What was their role in all of this? Let's zoom into the historical developments, okay? So we have nationalist leaders and parties that participated in these independence movements from imperial rule. You have the Indian National Congress, very important, make sure you know it. Ho Chi Minh in French Indochina, you know, from Vietnam. Uh, Kwame Kumra in the British Gold Coast of Ghana. And you have Gamel Abdel Nasir in Egypt, okay? Those are the uh, leaders in the parties. So let's look at negotiated nonviolence independence movements. You have India from the British, you have uh, Gold Coast from the British, and you have uh, French West Africa, right, from the French. This is nonviolent negotiated diplomatic process. And on the other hand, you have independence through armed struggle. The Algerians kicked out the French. Angola kicked out the Portuguese, the Vietnamese kicked out the French, okay? That was armed struggle. You also had religious, regional, and ethnic movements. Very important to understand the Muslim League in British India. They played an instrumental role, kicking the British out, okay? All right, let's move on. So what you have here in this map, I mean, look, before 1945, almost every color on this map means that the French, the British, the Dutch, the Belgians, the Spanish, the Italians, Japanese, and the Americans control this section of the world, Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. So China and the Middle East and Peach right there were not really uh, directly colonized and controlled. Right? These were colonies, colonial affiliations. Now, what happens after 1945? Boom, an explosion of independence movements, either through nonviolent diplomacy or violent resistance. And every color you see here is a former European or American colony. All right, so now how did this unfold? We need to zoom into the actions to be able to reveal complexity, right? Was it real simple? No, it was really complex. So you're gonna have to reveal complexity. All right, so by the end of this lesson, you're gonna understand how India negotiated independence from Britain after World War II. That's our first part one focus. And the skills understand how to make connections between historical events. Here we go. Decolonization. To remind you, it's the process of colonies achieving independence and creating their own nations. And it occurred mostly after the end of World War II, post-1945. So you think of it as like a reversal of imperialism or colonialism, right? This is, instead of them coming in, this is kicking them out, those imperial powers. Independence usually occurred through either negotiations or armed resistance. Keep that in mind. Let's look at India. Case in point, the seeds of decolonization in India. Well, remember this, the Indian National Congress. They were founded in 1885. They were the leading political party focused on reforming India and gaining independence from Great Britain. They started a nationalist movement and it was led by, you know him, Mahatma Gandhi, one of the most famous individuals of the 20th century after 1920. And it was made up of educated middle-class Indians who initially sought for Indians to have greater voice in the government. And then they sought independence from Great Britain because Great Britain uh, during World War II promised them independence if they helped fight in the war. War's over, they broke their promise, and that's what sparked this independence movement. So once again, Gandhi utilized and organized nonviolent civil disobedience, okay? 
uh, what he termed the Satyagraha to achieve independence from Britain. Hindus and Muslims in India, they both supported independence. Look at that. Although different religious perspectives and cultural traditions right there, they both supported independence from Great Britain. So one example of organized civil disobedience, the Salt March. Imagine this. Gandhi led a 240 mile long walk to the sea to protest the British monopoly on selling salt. A lot of natural salt minerals in the earth in India. Indians sold salt and bought salt from other Indians, breaking British law. They did it on purpose. Civil disobedience, that's the example. The protesters were violently beaten by the British and over 60,000 people were arrested. Hoboken is four square, uh, it's one, uh, I'm sorry, one square mile. So if you were to walk around Hoboken, you walk close to four miles. Imagine walking 240 miles to make your point. And that gives you to the extent that these uh, native uh, indigenous Indians from India wanted independence from Great Britain. Britain was uh, economically and militarily weakened due to World War II. We know this, right? They didn't have the resources to sustain colonial control in India. And this was the opportune time uh, for Indians to break away and push Great Britain out. They negotiated their independence from Britain in 1947. All right. Where do women fit in all this drama? Well, during this national movement for uh, Indian independence, <clears throat> Gandhi and his movement, they embraced efforts to mobilize women for struggle against Britain and elevate their standing in marriage and society. So there was a bit of progressive movement here. They asserted spiritual equality of men and women. They could contribute to the independence movement by spinning and weaving their own family's clothing, boycotting British textiles. Yet at the same time, they never completely broke with older Indian conceptions of gender roles, okay? So it's a little more complex. So uh, Gandhi says the duty of motherhood, well, it requires qualities which man need not possess. A woman, she, is supposed to be passive. He is supposed to be active. She is essentially a mistress of the house. He's the breadwinner, all right? So although women were given a little bit more progressive independence, um, the Indian nationalist movement still held on to those traditional cultural values, okay? Let's take a look at the prompt. Give us some historical background, Mr. D. All right. Well, the rise of national movements in the modern nation state, it's, it has affected women's political and economic participation and social freedoms. So here's the prompt. Analyze the opportunities and the barriers that nationalist movements posed concerning women's rights in the 20th century. I'm gonna give you about 60 seconds. I want you to think about it, and then I'm gonna call on you and we'll have a small conversation on the analysis of this prompt. Okay, Alexa, if you see the word analyze, what do you think they're trying to prompt you to do with the documents? Like examine them and like determine like to what extent, like not extent, but- No extent here. So what does analyze mean? When you look at that document, what are you looking for? We haven't spent a lot of time on this word analyze. When you see the word analyze, if I ask you to analyze something. With their purpose, maybe? Well, that's one small component of the entire thing. Uh, of, of If I ask you to analyze your relationship between you and your best friend, would you say, oh, that's simple, Mr. D, or would you say, oh, that's complicated, Mr. D? I'd say it's complicated. Exactly. Everybody, when you see the word analyze, it means reveal complexity. 
what they're prompting you to do in the DBQ, they're saying in these documents, they're not straight up easy to organize because inside of those documents, there's going to be either opposing viewpoints or it's going to be complicated because you can say, well, part of this document reveals this while the other part reveals that in the same document. All right. So analyze means reveal complexity in each document. Remember that. Okay. All right. Miguel, when you see the phrase opportunities and barriers, what clues does that provide to you about the style of the essay? Uh, I think of like benefits and limitations. Benefits of limitations, positive and negative. And what would you be, yeah. what would you do with those? Uh, compare and contrast. Right now, that's the first clue. Maybe this is compare and contrast. So we're going to group these. We're going to look for opportunities and we're going to look for barriers, right? And when they say analyze, they're saying, look, those documents are going to be complicated. So inside each document, look for opportunities and barriers. Maybe they're all in there, right? That's what would make the document complicated in which you would have to perform analysis to reveal the complications, right? Um, nationalist movements and women's rights. So Reedy, what are nationalist movements and women's rights? I'm not asking you to define them according to like Webster's dictionary. I'm asking you according to prompt analysis. What are those? Uh, like historical development. Excellent. That's all I wanted to know. And we're looking in the 20th century. So when we see this, what were the big movements going on in the 20th century? Well, you had the Cold War and decolonization movements, right? So as soon as you look at those documents, the first one is decolonization. The second one is decolonization. Third one is decol. Okay, they're talking about decolonization here. They're not really talking about communism. So that's what the whole DBQ is about when you see that, okay? All right. Here we go. Seven minutes. Everybody jump into the document. It's about her. So she would want to like frame her achievements in the best light. Right? Dan, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Do you remember what color shoes you wore when you were two? No. Okay. Do you remember what oh. you ate two months ago? Oh, you're saying it's too detailed. So she might be making some stuff up. Not making some stuff up. But look at this, the source. She recalls her life in the year 1994. They start asking her to tell her about her life. She's like, back in March of 1922, what? This That's is 72 years ago. Okay, so the limitation of this document, these events were recalled 72 years later and may contain historical inaccuracies. This would need further corroboration to raise her credibility. So would, they would take this document, right? A real historian, a journalist, would go and find other people of her age in her, you know, who had a similar experience and interview them. And if the experiences matched, if they corroborated, that raises the credibility of the, to what, to what extent is she really telling an accurate historical truth, right? That's a limitation in this document. So you got to look at that as well. Okay. So that is how we reveal complexity, analyze the opportunities and barriers of nationalist movements, uh, post concerning women's rights in the 20th century. Analyze, reveal complexity through detailed examination. Opportunities and barriers are, you know, benefits or limitations, positive and negative. National movements and women's rights, those are the historical developments, the 20th century, the historical period, and the similarities and the differences. So you kind of group them opportunities and barriers. So when you get a document like this, you can use it in the first paragraph, that's opportunities, and you can use it in the second paragraph, for barriers. So when you talk about the opportunities, reveal just the part where she talks about the opportunity that they get to march in the first paragraph that talks about opportunities. And in the second paragraph that talks about barriers, only mention the part, I can document one again, reveals this. That reveals complexity. That is how you reveal complexity. But there's more to it. We have 15 minutes and I'm gonna to try to run through this with you. Let's move on, part two, here we go. By the end of this part of the lesson, you're going to understand how Vietnam actually physically, violently fought for independence from France after World War II. This obviously differs with uh, um, India because that was a nonviolent movement using diplomacy. This is physical violence. 
we're going to understand how to make more historical connections between events. Here we go. Vietnam War, 1954, all the way to 1975, it was a type of proxy war, all right, during the Cold War. So Ho Chi Minh sought to create a unified communist Vietnam and sent the Viet Cong, you know, the communist guerrilla fighters, to fight in South Vietnam. Uh, the U.S. was not having that, right? Our policy of containment uh, dictated the USA to begin sending aid and military advisors working under the domino theory, which held that if one Southeast Asian country became communist, surrounding countries would fall like dominoes. So what happens? The USA ended up sending troops to fight alongside the South Vietnamese to prevent the spread of communism from North Vietnam. So North Vietnam received weapons from the USSR and China to fight against the USA and the South Vietnam. That's what makes it a proxy war. So due to the prolonged time of the war, the guerrilla tactics utilized by the Viet Cong and the increased anti-war sentiment in the USA, the USA withdrew and North Vietnam was successful in creating a unified communist Vietnam. How close is this historical development to our lives? My great uncle fought in this war. He was a prisoner of war taken to the north of Vietnam, which he was there for about five years. And he came back with post-traumatic stress disorder and he was never the same leading up to the last years of his life. And he lived up to over 90 years old, but he was a part of this historical development. And I know if you take the time to ask your family, World War II, Vietnam, possibly Korean War, there are members of your family that can remember other uh, distant uh, members of your family that might have participated in these historical developments. So Vietnam's independence movement from France. So after World War II, France attempted to hold on to that colony. You know, they called it Indochina, it's Vietnam. So using guerrilla warfare, the Vietnamese, the national nationalist group, they led by Ho Chi Minh were able to overthrow the French. They used violence, right? Resulted in a split North and South Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh led the communist North um, and Ninjing Dem led the democratic South. Ho Chi Minh wanted to unify all Vietnam as a communist nation and sent guerrillas to the South, which led to this civil war. Here is the document, same prompt about women. I want you to go through this document Let's take a look at the analysis here. So this one is a little bit more difficult. He does explicitly state uh, progressive values for women, but there's a lot inside of here that he infers, right, would be barriers for women. So let's take a look at the subject. Ho Chi Minh, he makes a speech to indigenous Vietnamese regarding his plans for a new state, a worker, peasant, and here's the big words, soldier government soldier government okay that is a male dominated society right worker peasant soldier government so the purpose is to persuade vietnamese to support the indochinese communist party and oppose french imperialism okay so what is this style right what is this an opportunity or barrier this also reveals complexity it's a little bit tougher this is both this is both barrier and opportunity for women because violent actions taken by a male-dominated worker, peasant, soldier government. And he uh, um, implies this over and over again, which is an implied barrier for women, a male-dominated violent society, a soldier government. But there are opportunities here by providing universal education and more equality between when men and women, which he explicitly states at the bottom. Nine, to dispose education, to dispense education to all the people, and ten, to realize equality between men and women. And also outside of this document, we understand that the system of socialist communism also provided more equality between gender roles than the competition in traditional uh, um, values, monotheistic values in uh, the capitalist society okay so what's the limitation here well these are the words and perspective of ho chi minh the male leader of north vietnamese communist movement he could not understand the full extent of opportunities and barriers posed for women because he cannot experience them from the perspective of a woman he's a man right so you can use that as a limitation here 
So this also reveals complexity. It reveals both. It implies one, uh, it implies the barriers with the militaristic society, and it explicitly states some of the opportunities, education for women and more equality between men and women, especially coming from, coming from the communist perspective. So when they say analyze, you know the documents are going to be complex because they're going to show more than one perspective or more than one component to the argument in each document, if not every document. So what is important to take away from here? This is what you need to remember. Decolonization is the process of colonies achieving independence and creating their own nations by two major methods. Okay, They occurred mostly after the end of World War II. It was either going to be violent or nonviolent. At the end of World War II, some colonies negotiated their independence, like India, which is an example of nonviolent protest and civil disobedience under the leadership of Gandhi. And in 1947, they gained their independence. Vietnam is a different example where Ho Chi Minh used violent means to spark an independence movement against French imperialism. When you see the word analyze, it means reveal complexity. You really want to look at the details of the document through detailed examination. Okay. And you can reveal complexity by doing this, corroborating evidence between two sources with conflicting viewpoints. So you found opportunities and barriers in document one and opportunities and barriers in document two. Wow. You've revealed complexity. Can you take it a step further? and reveal an even deeper level of complexity. You can by corroborating evidence between two sources, document one and two, with conflicting viewpoints. Although they have conflicting viewpoints, there are uh, uh, components which match up inside the argument like this. Gandhi's viewpoint was nonviolent independence, while Ho Chi Minh's viewpoint was independence through violence. They conflicted. Although their perspectives on nationalist movements differ, both documents similarly reveal opportunities and barriers nationalist movements posed for women's rights in the 20th century. That is complexity right there, my friends. Okay? I hope this helps.